Praise the Lord, saints. Praise the Lord. If you'll turn with me in your Bibles to the book of 2 Peter, chapter number 3, chapter 3 and verse number 9, my subject tonight is God's compassion. God's compassion. And you give me an amen when you're in 2 Peter, chapter number 3. Amen. Amen. And verse number 9 uh, reads, The Lord is not slack concerning his, his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And the church said, Amen. 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 So, the subject that Peter is dealing with in this verse is the coming of the Lord, and I'm going to get to the compassion here in a minute, but I want to give us some background on, on what he's compassionate about. So the thing that, the second clause that he says, God is long-suffering, but is long-suffering, that means that God practices restraint even though he's being provoked. God doesn't just jump on somebody when they do wrong. Some of us do that, but that's not what God does. See, I've had to learn to do that even on the job. You don't just jump on people. You're going to push them away like that. That's not how you help people do better. If you chase everybody away that makes a mistake on the job, pretty soon you're not going to have anybody to work for you. And as hard as it is to find employees nowadays, it's not really the best thing for you to do. You're going to shoot yourself in the foot. So God doesn't do that either. God doesn't just immediately just jump on people. And some people take advantage of that. The scripture talks about how because judgment against an evildoer is not executed speedily, it's altogether set in the hearts of men to do evil continually. So because God is not striking people down, people say that God is my witness or God strike me down if I'm lying. If God actually did that, <laughs> strike people down when they're lying, they're, they're maybe less liars in the world. But because God doesn't do that sort of thing, people just carry on. They think God's just like them. But what Paul is dealing with here is the coming of the Lord. And so, or excuse me, Peter, not Paul. What Paul, or excuse, I said it again. What Peter had been dealing with was the fact that in the last days, which we're in now, there would be scoffers, people that laugh and, well, where is the promise of his coming? Where's the coming of the Lord? And you might not think that, that happens, but I've seen it happen twice. Uh, one with a, a Holy Ghost filled minister. You mentioned the coming of the Lord, and, and I mentioned the coming of the Lord to him, or the rapture, one of the two, and he said, Oh, people have been saying that for years. Are you kidding me? <laughs> if, that's what I'm here for. <laughs> that's, my, that's the main thing, is the rapture. That's what I'm getting ready for. But, but I shouldn't be surprised because Peter said that those kinds of people would come. And he said, they'd say, well, since the beginning of the world, since the fathers fell asleep, everything's continued like it was. Where's the promise of his coming? And so Peter had to, had to let us know. He's saying God's not slack concerning his promise as some men count slackness. God's not procrastinating or he, God's not late or lazy like some people consider lazy. He, God's not late like that. God's not going to be tardy. God knew before the foundation of the world the exact moment to set for the rapture. He knew that. But what God is doing is he's showing long suffering. He's allowing these people to do wrong and people think they're getting away with it, but that's not the case. What he's doing in that period of long suffering, he's not condoning people to do wrong. But it says that not willing that any should perish. God doesn't want those evildoers to have to go to hell. Now, we might want people to go to hell, but God does not. And I don't mean that in a vulgar, vulgar way. Some people might want to see their enemies end up in the lake of fire. But God does not want any of us to end up in the lake of fire. Anybody. I'm going to leave that alone. But your worst enemy, God doesn't want them to go to hell. It says... Such a small word, and it's so powerful, too. Not willing that any should perish, but that, and here's another one, all should come to repentance. So, if I continue in sin, the scripture says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. So, God's not willing that any should perish. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. So, sin brings the punishment of death. Death came by sin. So... God's way out, we see from this verse of perishing, of death, is repentance. 
He's saying, and I'll, and I'll read it again so I can show you how we can understand that from this verse. He said, in the last part, he said, But as long suffering to us word, not willing that any should die, not willing that any should face that punishment of death, but on the other hand, so that they don't, fa- that they don't have to perish, should come to repentance. If all came to repentance, then none would have to perish. So what is the way that I escape sin? What is the way that I escape the punishment of going to the lake of fire? Well, it's not by confessing Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. It's not by going to church every Sunday and Tuesday and Wednesday, even though those, that's important to do. It's not by reading and studying as much as I can every single day, even though I should have an appetite. I should be uh, reading and studying my Bible. I should be digging the Word of God. But, but here the verse lets us know that the way of escaping the lake of fire is through repentance. It's through abhorring who I am, what I've done, and stopping and turning from that. That's what repentance means means is an about face. With the Sunday school kids, I used to have them stand in one spot and I'd say, repent, and I'd have them do a military about face, 180 degrees. That's what repentance is. It's an about face from who you are, an about face from what you've done, an about face from everything that you identify yourself with that is not of God. So that's the context. So, so where does God's compassion fit in? God knows better than us what the wages of sin are. God knows what it really means to eternally perish more than we do. We think we know. We think we, think we know what hell is. And we, the scripture gives us some clues, enough to know that we don't want to go there. But none of us have faced that. So God does, though. Matter of fact, God is the one that created the lake of fire. In the book of Isaiah, the scripture says that the breath of the Lord doth kindle it. God is the one that created the lake of fire. It's a place of eternal torment. The Bible says where the worm dieth not in the, uh, how, how does it go? Where the, and the fire is not quenched. It's eternal punishment where you, you want to stop existing, but you never will. Amen. You never, never will. And so God understands that better than we do and doesn't want that on anybody. As a matter of fact, even though God created hell, And he knew that mankind would end up there. He still didn't make hell for mankind. Still did not design. That's how, that's how powerful God's salvation is. Is that even though he knew that mankind, not, that some would perish, he still did not design hell for a single person to fit in there. Jesus said that hell was prepared for the devil and his angels. But, because, uh, because people have rejected knowledge, hell hath enlarged herself without measure, and the pomp and pride of men descend into it. So God never intended for, for hell to be the eternal punishment for mankind. He never wanted that and still doesn't want that. What is his way for people to escape that then? He offers repentance. He doesn't want us to face that. So what does he do? He offers us to turn from our wicked ways like he did with Cain. Cain had had been doing wrong. Cain was in false worship. And what did God say to him? If thou doest well, if you stop doing wrong and start doing right, I'm going to accept you. That's what has been the key to salvation in every dispensation is repentance. So the way that God offers us uh, a way out of, of, of the lake of fires through repentance. In the book of Second Chronicles, chapter number 36, there's more than one instance in the Bible where God offers people repentance, and we're going to look at one of them for an example, and it was with uh, the tribe, the house of Judah. In Second Chronicles, chapter number 36, you can give me an amen when you get there. Amen. So the background on this verse, uh, simply put, is that The children of Israel had been separated into two nations, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, what was called Israel and Judah, two separate nations. And Israel, about 135 years before, because of their wickedness, had been driven out of the land, and now Judah is about to face the same thing. This is pretty much exactly what brought them into the promised land in the first place. 
God had told them in the book of Deuteronomy that don't think Israel, don't think my people that I'm giving you this nation because of how righteous you are. He let them, he let them know, if you don't believe this in Deuteronomy chapter 9, he said, because of the wickedness of the nations that lived here before and because I made a promise to your fathers, that's why I'm going to bring you in. In one place he said the land itself spews out the people that live here because of their abominations. So don't you do like what they do or this land's going to spew you out too. Well, guess what they did? They went and did what those nations did and now they've got to face the consequences. However, God is offering them a way out. And that's through repentance. So in 2 Chronicles 36 and verse 14, the scripture speaking of uh, Judah says, Moreover, all the chief of the priests and the people transgressed very much after all the abominations of the heathen. The exact thing that God warned them not to do when they went in. Don't act like these people I'm kicking out. Because if you do, I'm going to kick you out too. That's exactly what they did. As a matter of fact, they, they practiced uh, what was called the right of, um, oh, what was it, not Baal, uh, Molech, the right of Molech, where they would cause their children to pass through the fire. They would burn their own babies as a sacrifice, and they would use the drums and commotion of the party to drown out the screams of the children. It was terrible, and this was supposed to be the people of God. They, they got way off. They practiced witchcraft and and uh, made themselves idols and all these sorts of things. And this is a very, very bad state. But notice God hadn't uh, smitten them right away. Why? Because he's offering them repentance. They transgressed very much after all the abominations of the heathen and polluted the house of the Lord, which he had hallowed in Jerusalem. They had made themselves images that they had set in the house of the Lord. And I believe it was the two sons of Levi laid with, with the women that came to the tabernacle at the very door of the tabernacle. They got this thing all mixed up in verse 15. And the Lord God of their fathers sent to them by his messengers, rising up betimes and sending, because he had compassion on his people. In one place it said um, that he uh, spake against them, that he testified against them. But look how he says it. And the Lord God of their fathers sent to them by his messengers, by his preachers. See, God doesn't just speak to people out of thin air. David said in, I think it was in 2 Samuel or 1 Samuel, uh, one of the two. David said, the spirit of the Lord spake by me and his word was in my mouth. God speaks through his preachers. And so what he was doing was, he, God told Isaiah, spare not. Uh, cry out, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet in Zion and show my people their sins. If I'm not preaching again to expo and exposing sin, I'm not preaching at all. The preaching, the prophets weren't sent to let people know the blessing that they were going to get. If I get a blessing in this life, that's good. But I don't need you to tell me that, that that's what's going to happen. The scripture said, blessed be the Lord God who daily loadeth us with benefits. I don't need to know that God's going to bless me. The scripture already said he's going to. What I need to know is if I'm transgressing the word of God. What I need to know, what I need to do is be set straight every now and then. And have somebody over me to let me know that I've stepped out of line so that I don't perish. And so this is what God was doing. He, the Lord, he sent, excuse me, verse 15. And the Lord God of their father sent to them by his messengers, rising up he times and sending. The message was exposing them. Look what you've done. Look at the things that you've put before God. Look at the sin that you've gotten yourself into. Look at the abomination, the filth that you've brought into my house. Why was he doing it? Why was he showing them they're wrong? Not because he was mean. Not because God is a mean taskmaster, a big bully upstairs that just wants to show people that they're wrong all the time. God is not like that. But he shows us those things, it says, because he had compassion on his people. Why does he show us we're wrong? Why does he have preachers preaching against sin? Not because he's mean, not because he wants to put us down and make us feel little, not because he's holding us back like the devil wants you to think, but because he's having compassion. He knows that if we don't get out of sin, we're going to end up in the lake of fire where he does not want us to be. 
He had compassion. So they preached repentance. And what is the message today? Jesus said that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name beginning at Jerusalem. If I'm not preaching sin, exposing sin, and preaching repentance, I'm not preaching the gospel. I'm not preaching what Jesus told me to preach. He said, preach repentance. This is the way out of the punishment of, of death, of sin and death. And let's read on in verse uh, number 16. Now this is where they really, this was the straw on the camel's back right here that really got them kicked out of the promised land. Uh, do you remember the story of Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and, and of King Nebuchadnezzar? The, the things that happened after Israel, excuse me, Judah was taken captive. This is the reason they were taken captive. Because if they would have repented, God had told them in the book of Jeremiah that I will do you no harm. But they didn't repent. And that was the straw on the camel's back. In verse number 16, But they mocked the messengers of God. Now you might think, well, nobody, nobody does that uh, today. People don't mock the pastor. Well, here's another word for mocked is ridiculed. Well, he puts his pants on one leg at a time just like me. He didn't go to seminary no way. That's the kind of thing that we need to stay away from, is mocking the messengers of God. So they mocked the messengers of God and despised his word. What, what were they doing to despise his word? They were acting presumptuously. I know what God wants for me and I just don't care. So all of us have messed up. And we are human and we may mess up again before the rapture happens. But God will help clean us up. God has a way for us to get out of it through repentance. The scripture gives us uh, 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 different things that there are to restoration. But what the problem was here was that when God showed them the wrong that they did, they weren't interested in doing better. That was the problem is that they were presumptuousness. Yes, they had done wrong and wrong is wrong. And there's a punishment for that. But God wasn't going to have them kicked out of the promised land until they despised his word, until they just, you know, what, I don't care. And look what else it says and despised his words and misused his prophets they stoned one prophet named Zechariah they kicked Jeremiah to the bottom of a, uh, a miry pit the history says Isaiah was sawn in half until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people till there was no remedy and that last verse is my last major point is till there was no remedy if I reject the messenger of God who's calling me to repent I've rejected God's compassion. What help is there for me then? In Hebrews, it talks about that it's impossible to, if they've fallen away, tasted of the, of the power of the world to come, tasted of the heavenly gift, and fallen away, it's impossible to renew them to repentance. If I know what God wants of me, and I do wrong, and, and, the, and the word comes across the pulpit, or the pastor talks to me and lets me know that I need to get out of this, and I'm just not interested in doing better, what help is there for me at that point? The scripture said, I believe it was in the book of Proverbs, He that is oftentimes reproved and hardeneth his neck shall suddenly be destroyed, and that without remedy. I have exhausted the compassion that God is trying to extend to me through the call of repentance if I just ignore God. So then why do you think the scripture says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. When God is calling you to repentance, he is near to you. He's not being mean. He wants to save you from the lake of fire and he is near to you. Seek the Lord by turning from the thing that he's exposed in your life because he wants you to live. And I want to live too. Amen. Amen. And I want all of us to live. Amen. Amen. God's compassion that he shows through the call of repentance. Amen.